This is Tyler Lewis here with Phenon Hoops. We're honored today to have one of the best up-and-coming coaches with us today, Coach Mims. Thanks for joining us. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. Living the dream right now. How are you? I can't complain, man. You know, getting to talk basketball. You can't beat that. Can't beat it at all. In your first year at Cape Fear Academy, you have a really talented group, um, and you already had so much success. The one thing I really love about your coaching style is how energetic and how engaging you are with your group. Um, when you look at your group right now, what's the first thing that you think of when you think of your group? Um, I think we got size, uh, a lot of length, um, a lot of versatility. You know, we could we can play some zone, we could play some man. We match up pretty well with everybody we've played, and um, we're, we're super young. So, like potentially, man, it. it it's hard to even set a bar because they, you know, they, every day they, they show me something new. So as a coach, I just got to stay, you know, um, as you said, I got to be involved because we don't, we're so young. We don't have any leadership. So I got to kind of take that role for now till they figure it out. So I'm consistently always having to talk like I used to when I played, but eventually I'm praying that, you know, it won't have to be my voice. They'll, they'll talk amongst themselves and the camaraderie me and the energy and stuff will be eternal. But until then, you know, initially I was trying to just let them talk and they wouldn't talk at all. And I, one of my mentors was like, uh, nah, you, you can't allow them to try to figure it out on their own. You're going to struggle even worse. So you're going to have to, you know, talk to them till they sick of hearing you. So that's what and I've been did. doing. So we both know um, you mentioned talking with your players. Um, a great team is always player driven. Um, and I know you want to have put some leaders, have some leaderships, players step up into that role to, so they can talk and not yourself. And as a player, you mentioned you were a talkative person. How, how is that so important as a player to step into that leadership role? Well, for one, when you have a very young team with a lot of talent, you're going into a very uh, – uh, the conference we're going to play in is going to be super competitive. The area that I'm in is super competitive. There's lots of um, really top talented guys. And if you're trying to get to the next level or use basketball as an opportunity to get a better education or – you know what I'm saying, get in college and all that, or maybe even actually be a pro or whatever it is as far as networking and communication. It's super important that in our area that, you know, you're ready to compete and you can't come out here not prepared. And that's the biggest thing because everyone's going to have their eyes on me because no one's really ever always viewed me as a, as a coach yet. So they don't necessarily know what I know. You know what I'm saying? So it's also important to me that as I'm building a program that I, I present something that other kids want to be a part of. Because, we, you know, I want it to be a situation where kids understand parents will send them to me and they'll come out a way better young person and they'll be a little bit more mature and they'll be able to have better leadership skills. So what, going back with point guards and things like that, my point guard is a sophomore. And last year he had to play the two guard position and then he's underage. You know what I'm saying? Like he really should be a freshman, but he skipped a grade. So I already know, and he, you know, he's from out, he's, he's not even from the town that we're from. He's from Durham, which is Caden. Then I have Tristan as well, who runs some point for me as well. And he's played a lot of two last year and he was on a guard driven team. So neither one of them really know how to run a team. They don't know feel. They don't know. All right. Since he's been hitting a couple, we need to give him the ball. Okay. He's struggling. We need our big man's been running the court. He's been rebounding. We need to get him a touch. Okay. I need to get a touch right here. Okay. The defense is not guarding this situation. They got to understand that. So I'm constantly always teaching and I'm always making them watch film because what I'm noticing is kids at that age, they don't really watch film. And if they do watch film, the unfortunate thing is everybody's giving out highlights. So all the, they don't know how a play happened, how the spacing was, you know, what kind of screen or how to read. They just see highlights and that's all they think that basketball is. So when it gets to me, it sucks because everyone's worked on their handles and dribbling and one-on-one -on -one moves. But when you're playing against really good, talented teams, it's a team concept. The ball has to be shifted. You have to be able to score on the catch. You got to be able to make reads on the catch. And the higher the level you go, the faster your decision-making has to be because the game is quicker. So being able to communicate through all the tough tension and teams we played against, it's been it's crazy. So the climate is reckless. So I have to consistently always teach them how to play through storms. That's what I'm kind of always into. So I'm always forcing them to talk. If they don't talk, you know, you get penalized for that. If you're on the bench and you're not interactive, you're not going to get in the game. You know, if you come in the game and you don't tell the person who you're guarding or what defense we're in, or, you know, if there's a dead ball and there's no discussion, you know, I, I'm, I'm preaching that it has to happen. And I have a good enough team where 
if it's not done by one, I can grab someone off the bench. I am comfortable enough to bring them in and not lose anything. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think I have two of everything, but I do think as a team, I can put together different um, lineups and, and get away with somebody. If I have a super talented person who's not doing what they need to do. So accountability is a must. Yeah. I mean, you got to have account- accountability out there and obviously you hold yourself accountable to a very, to a very high standard. And that allows you to um, hold your players accountable. And I know they respect you and they, they trust you. I mean, you've done so many great things for them already. And the way you lead your group um, with your voice and by example is really special. And I mean, I, I see that from the outside looking in. So I know your players love playing for you. When did you, when did you kind of first fall in love with the game of basketball? Uh, well, my dad, my dad was a pro. He played, uh, he's a Hall of Famer at Federal State. He was all Army in the military, like two, three years. And he got an opportunity to play for the Sixers where he got injured. So my whole entire life growing up, my dad would, you know, he, he would bring up me and my sisters to the gym and put us on the side and give us toys. And we'd watch him play or we just had to, we can't move because my mom would, would make a bring, a, bring a, bring the kids with him. And so we became what you call, what we call in Fayetteville, a gym rat where you just, you're around it so much. And I realized like back then, you know, in Fayetteville, we, we played on Fort Bragg. The amazing thing about Fayetteville is, and Fort Bragg, is that it's a melting pot of different cultures, people coming in and out all the time. So we get a lot of different talent because it'd be kids coming in and out because they have the second largest base in the world. So there's always going to be different people around here. So when I used to go on base and my dad being in the military, I used to run into all kinds of different people. And I learned so much, so many different things that they don't learn now. You know, the older kids, older people aren't teaching as much as they were when I was coming up. So it was, it was no joke. Like everybody couldn't get on the court. And if you didn't know your positioning or spacing, you know, you're going to get bust out and kicked off the team. You know, you better sit in that corner. And if you so happen to touch it, you know, you better make the right decision. You better play defense and get back. And if a big man gets you on a block, you better foul him. You can't make <laughs> it for real. So these are just things that, you know, with me, I just learned, I just love the camaraderie. I love the communication. I love the dialogue. Like they used to get to the gym at eight in the morning. So they get to like seven 30 in the morning and waiting outside to get in first to sign the list. And so everybody in there is just talking about whoever was playing Scotty Pippen, who got drugged the last week. Just, it was just so much interaction. I just learned so much, you know, it was just something that I just wanted to be a part of for my entire life. Now it's funny. Uh, initially I didn't even really play. Uh, my dad would bring me to the gym, but I really didn't want to practice like that. And I got to be in maybe, I want to say the fourth or fifth grade, probably fifth grade. Um, this summer going into my sixth grade, I was a follower. So I used to watch and wherever the kids would go and do stuff, I would do it. So I ended up getting in a situation where I was following somebody doing something wrong. They went into somebody's house and stole some games. I was the lookout. They never got caught, but then he gave me a couple of the games. My mom found out about the games. She made me give the games back to the person anonymously, but I had put the, my initials on them like an idiot. So I ended up having to meet the lady, apologize. And so from that day on, my dad and mom were like, you know, you're a Christian. You've been brought up in the right household. With basketball, it was just a situation where um, I just wanted to be a part of something that was family-like. It taught life lessons. And ultimately, um, you know, I got to be around my friends and I got to be around my dad's friends. And I think that it is lifetime relationships. And on top of all of that, you could meet somebody you didn't really know that well. And then it's just y'all just interact because y'all got some connections that most people will never know. So I could see you and meet you. We could talk. And all of a sudden, it's like we're brothers. You know, we, we can just relate on such a different level because it takes so much of a sacrifice and a compromise to get to the level you want to if you're going to be an elite person on the next level, like college or pro. So it's just I have so much appreciation for the game and what it's done for me as a person, you know, so as a trainer and a coach and all that other stuff, it was more so about being the person. What was the quote I heard? Um, be the person you needed when you were growing up. And not to say my, my family didn't work there for me, but I needed someone probably to be even harder than I than they were on me. And that's yeah. why I am with the kids. I'm super accountable with them. I'm super consistent. I, and I think that it's kind of been working with the kids that I have. And, you know, people have to realize that it's not a microwave society. Everyone feels like they should be good right away. And I'm okay with playing top teams, like you say, and losing, you know, if, if I'm losing, learning how to play the right way. Because eventually us playing the right way will get us to win. And, and you talk about playing the best teams and you, you don't shy from any competition. You're not scared of nobody. You're willing to play 
top teams in the country, people who are not in your league. And that's one thing I respect about you because, you know, in order to be the best, you got to beat the best. And, you know, growing up at the gym, like if you're going to stay on the court, you got to beat the best. Like you got it. And then all of a sudden you, you get to the point where you are the best and then you're out there the whole time. So that thing is just going to keep on going on with you because you're going to play the best. You're going to get to that point where you're going to have such a successful program. There's going to be teams that are scared of you. And, and that's just real talk. Um, who has been, I mean, you mentioned your dad a little bit um, about your love for the game. Would you say he's your biggest influence kind of in your life on and off the court? Uh, between him and my mother. You see, my mother is just an influence of everything. Oh, yeah, my mother and father. Um, my father, of course, because he played basketball more than my mother did. But my mother instilled so many uh, different virtues about me. The reason I'm so charismatic, the reason I'm outspoken, the reason I know how to identify with communication and talk to people and, you know, relate with them and be humble and understand that no one's perfect. You got to be patient. You know, most people don't want to be patient with people and they always have expectations. I don't have super high expectations of people. I just, you know, I know I model by example. So if I'm going to give you respect, I'm going to be honest and talk to you and be out, you know, and not talk behind your back and be consistent. That's what I'm expecting. So I think the energy I, I give off with basketball, it kind of just goes around. People like to be around me and the kids love it. And also I teach the kids, I call it teaching them how to play the game meaning the game inside the game. So you have, people have to like you. <laughs> or we call it, we use the word um, magnetism, right? Uh, magnetism is, means that people like to be around you and you're, you're always got some type of good thing going around you. So my kids, what I'm preaching is for them to always have magnetism and bring uh, about a type of energy of camaraderie, uh, of togetherness and consistency and balance. And so, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's difficult at times, but you know, they're getting there. They're getting there. So mm -hmm. for ours, me, like my mom and dad, whatever they passed on to me, that's what I pass on to everyone else. So I'm not me, of course, without them. Hey, hey, you're a very likable person, though, man. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> for sure. I mean, you know, if, if, if you're not likable, you're not going to have players that want to play for you. No. I mean, no. As, as, as tough as you are on your players, I mean, they, they got to like you because they really respect you and they love playing with you. That's for a but fact. Ty, they still can't beat me. I still can't. I still don't lose. Like, I know it's going to happen eventually because I keep teaching them all the secrets and I play less. But for right now, none of them. They can't beat me yet. Well, you, you, you kind of you led me into my next question of, like, your playing days. Um, growing up and, like, what made you kind of retire from basketball? And do you ever, like, when you're out there coaching, just, like, get the itch to just get in practice and play with them all the time? That's those are great questions. Um, the reason I stopped playing was because I had my son when he was young, you know, so he's 20 right now. So during the time when I was playing college ball and then going overseas, it was a time where I would have been away from him. And I was away from him for like two years and I just couldn't enjoy basketball. The language barrier and all that wasn't so bad. I, I love playing. I learned how to play the game a lot better, but it just wasn't for me to be around. It wasn't worth it. I wasn't making enough money to be away from stuff that was going to be priceless that I'll never get back. And, and that, so, that, kind of, that kind of stands out because I, I know kind of what you do, you're, you dealt with because when I was in college coaching, the one thing I missed most was my family. So oh man. I got into Phenom because I wanted to be with my family more, my wife more. And then now I get to work with my dad and brother. So I know how much family means to me. And I know, I mean, whenever you're away from your kid, I know how crazy that is. So difficult, man. Difficult. Yep. Well, that's awesome. I know. I know you're such a family guy. Um, that that's. I mean, obviously, that's that's number one. Well, guys, number one. Family's number two. Basketball down the line. That's us. Right. In the Absolutely. grand scheme of things, basketball is not as important as a lot of other things in this world is. We 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 make it out to be. If we lose a game, we act like it's the end of the world. But you know, at the end of the day, it's you know. That, ball that, that, that that explains ball, a lot. That ball why, um, that explains a lot with your question. You're like, you know, you're not afraid to play anybody or being competitive. Well, with me, first off, it's not life or death. It's literally a basketball game. The worst thing that can happen in this basketball game is what we lose. Ooh, you know, that's not the end of the world. Now, on top of all of that, when you uh, you're trying to develop a kid to, you know, I, okay, they say you can't coach effort. And you can't coach like competitiveness, but I'm not completely sure that's true. 
I just think that you have to be more structured than when you're doing it. You got to make everything you do competitive. If we're going to get water, we're competing for water. You know what I'm saying? Yep. If, if somebody wants to wear this jersey, right, we're playing one-on-one for that. Oh, we, we, hey, when you get on that court <laughs> and, you, and you put on that jersey, you're competitive. Everybody wants to win, man. That's... But it's not – But see, with this day and age, I guess with them playing so many games and AAU and other things – they don't always have the same competitiveness. Like, it doesn't hurt as much to lose. Like, today, we had a huge uh, coming to Jesus moment. Because, like, in our zone, the issue was in the last game we lost, we gave up quite a few threes in the corner. And, and somebody pretty much hit eight threes on us. So, of course, the emphasis in practice is closeouts and getting to shooters. Correct? And there were times where we were going that back and forth down court and people were hitting multiple threes and everybody was excited about the threes going in. And all I could think about was like, how many we gave up? And I stopped the thing and I said, listen, y'all understand this. Yes, it's cool if we, we, we score and we have offense, but we gotta be able to stop people and we gotta be in position. So th there's gotta be a different type of urgency with your competitiveness. It has to have some strategy to it. We're trying to actually win. OK, now I know it, it feels good to look good and to be able to say you scored this amount. But what's going to help us win? Well, we got to stop them from scoring more than us. OK, and we got to score a certain amount of points every game for us to win. So once I was able to really break down and have the come to Jesus moment with them about giving up that, I don't think I saw another one giving up, which was really good. Now, it doesn't mean tomorrow when we have practice, I don't say anything. They go right back to it. So with kids. You just got to be patient and understand that eventually they will get it. You can never think that they're not going to get it because then they won't. <laughs> uh, you're right about that. When you step into a gym and I've never seen your team play, what am I going to walk in there and see? And what am I going to walk out and tell other people like, man, this team played hard? Or what am I going to walk out and take away? In the game or in practice? Both. Okay. Uh, in practice – you're going to you're going to have a very um, carefree, carefree uh, atmosphere. I, I like for my gym to be comfortable. I think the more comfortable my kids are, the better. Now, that doesn't mean they're not put in situations where they have to constantly be structured and be on point and be prompt and consistent. But I also, also want them to have the confidence to want to speak out. If there's something they don't understand, I want a kid to raise their hand and say it. Or if a coach, does, if he doesn't understand why, we're doing something. I want them to ask me so I can explain it to them. Cause I, a lot of times they don't, they don't, they don't know. I, I love, I love how you said come like being comfortable. Like, because we both know as point guards, if you're comfortable on the court and you're comfortable around other people, your game is going to be at the top. top of, you're going to be at the top of your game every single night. Even if you have a couple of turnovers, if you still feel comfortable, you still have that trust in coach and the players around you, you're comfortable in your own skin. Like you're going to be the best you can be day in and day out. And that's honestly, when you said that answer, I was like, man, like <laughs> comfortability is probably one of the best things you can have on the court. But you know what it does. You just said it. And I was going to, I'm, I'm going to give you a little more. I'm a piggyback with it. And they don't know this, but the comfort brings confidence. And what I'm saying with that is I got to see Tyler Lewis play when he was younger. He didn't know I was there. My dad coached the 71st, super talented team. They were in Winston. And when you walked in the gym and they was like, well, not, uh, Rick Lewis's son is a bad boy. I don't know who Rick Lewis is at that point. I don't know who these guys are or whatever. When I walk in the gym and you see the person with the ball orchestrating everything, putting the ball where he's be driving when they want to. Hit. I mean, utter confidence and that is so huge you know with teams and with my environment in my gym I was a point guard and you can see the difference there's a you can see a point guard that's nervous to make mistakes and is always trying to figure out you know to be a robot and do whatever the coach say or you got one that they just kind of they're completely comfortable like they know they're going to get their shots they know what spots to get to they know who to give the ball to they know when to turn it up and when not to turn it up and at the point guard position to me I mean, it's the most pivotal, but it's like the quarterback. It's how you start. You can't win. It's hard to win without good guard play. But you can win with good guard play and not have as good post play. That's what I think. Well, I mean, we both know um, the point guard is the leader on the court. It's the quarterback out there. They got to have complete control of the game at all times. That's what makes you – that's what makes a good team. Like you said, you can get by with not having a good 
big guy, but your guards is what's going to win games. So, Bad boy, they have to be an extension of the coach. They do, and they got to be a coach on the floor at all times. Oh my gosh, and kids don't, and it's hard because then you got it. Once they start coaching, right, then you got to teach them how to say it because they're going to start. Because a lot of my kids will coach, will uh, try to coach on the court emotionally. So if they're upset about something, that comes out when they coach. So now I got to teach them. Okay, when we when you're in this situation, my prime example, I give you a better one. How to help my kids? I had a big issue with feeding the post, and I just didn't understand why it was so hard. To me, it was the easiest thing I'd ever done in my entire life. I never knew why this seems to be so difficult, but that is not fair for me to say that. Of course, I had a Hall of Fame father who I could throw the ball whatever way he was gonna catch it. So I never really cared about placement or giving the ball either till I got older. So looking at it to now how they throw my big men, I, they'll feed them and they'll catch it seven, eight feet off the block and all kinds of stuff. And they, they were always fussing each other. It's either the, pus, the passer was fussing or the big was fussing. So one day in practice, that's how I did. I said, uh, somebody gave me the idea, Coach uh, Kafir, uh, Chris, no, Kafir Academy. I forgot what his name is. Really nice guy, very savvy. Um, he, I told him about my issue. You know, we always network. And he was like, yeah, try this. So what he told me to do is let your big men get the ball at half court. Let them be guarded by the other big men. They got to bring the ball to the 45. And they got to feed the post to uh, the guards posting up. Man, after the first 15 minutes, it's turnover every time. I stop and ask the bigs, like, yeah, what did you notice? Man, it's super hard giving the ball to the bigs. I ask the uh, guards, what, what's so hard about playing? Man, it's super hard to hold your position and get it. And from, from then on, I could see the camaraderie of them appreciating how hard it is to do each other's job was. And so it changed in the gym. Like the, the, the climate was completely different. It was really good. That, that's, that's awesome. You, you have helped so many people train the, and you trained a lot of great players. You developed a lot of great players, get to the next level. When did you kind of realize you had the gift to be able to teach the game and influence the youth like on and off the court? Coaches always told me when I was young that I, I, I had a great IQ for the game. Like I always asked questions. I was always at home um, watching games, old VHS, beta, you name it. I always was studying. I didn't know what to study. But I just I always was studying and watching. And so as I got older, playing point and all that other stuff, what happened is um, after I finished playing, when I went to college initially, I didn't have really any fundamentals. You know, I grew from like 5'11 to 6'5 in the summer. I played point, but I was never taught how to jump stop, how to pivot and pass, how to triple oh, threat. Up, I, just, I need to grow 5'11 to 6'5, coach. You got to have a 6'8 father. <laughs> well, my, my, father ain't, my father ain't that height, so. Yeah, I cheated. We I'm knew it was going to come eventually. I'm out of luck. But see, I played my whole career your height until <laughs> college. Isn't that weird? <laughs> you just hit so the you're trying to tell somebody 6'5", not to blow by nobody. You just, you just have to do angles. So I've been playing like a Ferrari my whole life, and now you want me to be a Volvo. It's not going to work. It takes time. So I, it was so much stuff I didn't know when I went to college. I was so embarrassed. I remember they, the first thing they had us do, I was at uh, – because my initial school I went to, because I didn't take the SAT till it was late. And so all the scholarships I had offered to me were already taken. So I had to go to North Carolina Wesleyan with a Hall of Fame coach, uh, John Thompson. Very good dude. Now, I knew I wasn't going to be there that long, but I knew I could learn a lot going there. And the first day I came, you got to catch the ball on the right, left, and rake across and finish off one dribble. And you talk about laughing at me. They laughed at me so hard because I had no idea how to do any of that. That whole My whole life I'd gotten that far and had never been taught that stuff. So for me, when I got older, it was a situation where as a um, after I finished playing and I, I happened to be the only person at home, God did some really weird things. Like my first set of kids I ever trained was Quay Parker, Dennis Smith Jr., uh, Mark Gilbert, who was at Duke who plays football. He's supposed to play in the NFL. Um, Jake, what's Jake's last name? He went D1 too. Uh, what's Jake's last name? Phillips. He ended up going, I think he went to like a military school. His father used to own Freedom Courts. I had all of them and my nephew, Alex. So a very talented bunch. But the only reason why I ended up being the person working with them was because of the situation where there was nobody really home. Like all the college kids are gone. There ain't nobody coaching. So it was a situation where Steve, could you show him some stuff? So it went from me showing him stuff to people constantly bringing me more. Oh, you training? And it used to be, you know, because everyone remember how well I could dribble. They didn't know I knew much about basketball. I just remember my handle. 
Like I was really elusive with handles. So initially they come to you, all they want you to do is teach them how to dribble and all that. And then eventually it, it branched out to more things. So it kind of, it was a natural for me because I've been in a position before where I didn't know I was uncomfortable. I was embarrassed. So my goal goes back to that quote, be the person you needed when you was growing up. Well, I needed somebody to teach me fundamentals. My daddy was a six, eight post player who self-taught himself. So he was not going to be able to teach me how to be a point guard. So that was just something that was important to me that when I started giving back to kids, I'd be patient and I teach them the stuff that I didn't know the basics. And it just grew from there. No, that's awesome. It's kind of crazy that you went to college with all that skill set and you didn't know the fundamentals of the game. And, and, that, and now you're teaching them at the highest level. So it's funny how God does things. I tell you that. No, it, it's, it's crazy, but it, that's a good thing. Now, 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 when you give me a call, I don't want to hear that your team had 18 turnovers <laughs> in, anymore. Well, so. you can't, you can't grade it if we're playing. We'll <laughs> Word of God. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. we're, we're, you got to expect that. <laughs> no, no, I, well, I tell you, we only had, we only had eight or six the last game. So, and, and you mentioned some of the players that you've trained, obviously some really talented players. Um, especially Dennis Smith, who's NBA. Um, how, how was it like training those types of players? They were all different, completely different, nothing the same. And some of them were way harder than others to train. Like if I'm training Dennis Smith Jr. and Quay Parker, you show them something once and they know it right away and they can implement it right away. You're not sitting around repping things with them. You're just suggesting and showing and that's it. Now, if you got a Josh Nickelberry, he's a different type of athlete. He's a, he's a worker. He wants high reps. So he was a kid that, you know, he wasn't necessarily as natural, but he had all the extremities, big hands, long, he could shoot, you know? So he was a kid. You could tell like my difference of training styles. Initially when I first started training, I was teaching all the secondary stuff, all the exciting, fun stuff to watch. So you see that with Quayne Jr. And then if you turn around and you look at Josh Nickelberry, he's basic fundamentals. He's as, he's as simple as you could call. He's, everything's off a pump fake, off a jab. He's an extended finisher and he can shoot. So you can tell where people talk trash about how I trained. So then my next kid that I, I reinvented, then I had Joey Baker, Greg Gant. I had uh, I mean, all these kids came through and you can tell like how I adjusted my training style and how those kids actually play. And so, you know, it, it doesn't mean that just because you – and first of all, it can't be just one person training them. It's multiple people. It takes a village to get a kid where they got to be. So I never want anyone to think that I said I made or did something like that. Nah, kid makes itself. You just get your village. You get passed along. God's like, yo, pass on your wisdom. You give them this and you keep it pushing. They don't owe you anything. And all I can really do is enjoy them from for afar. And all it does is prepare me for the bunch of kids I have now, you know. No, that, that's that's awesome. And you kind of mentioned in there, which I really loved, you kind of treated each of them a little different because each person is different. I mean, I'm different than you. Like, we're not going to go about our that's daily good. life the same way. We're not going to be on doing the same stuff on the court the same way. And, good, you know, great coaches and great trainers are able to figure out what each person needs in those situations, what they need to improve on. And they're going to coach. You can't coach the same person the same. So. Ever. I mean, you're going to coach each person fairly, but you can't you can't coach them the same. Because I'm 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 a mind games person. So like if I'm talking to Junior, I'm always reminding him of who's better than him or who's ranked higher than him. If I'm talking to Nickelberry, I'm telling him, uh, what do I say to Josh? Josh, man, you, you might as well just go home. You ain't ready to play today, man. You, you don't play basketball, man. You're just out here for the girls. What do you mean, man? You can't get five assists, man. You're not. You can't pass a little bit. I don't even know why I even train you. People, I don't even know why people think I train you because you literally cannot pass. It's the worst pass of it. So if I'm talking trash, saying that before you know it, it's competitive, and they don't even think about the fact that I'm actually mind engineering them to do what I want them to do. They're just doing it, and they don't know why at a high level. So some kids you don't have to yell at. Some you do. Some you got to be more loving. Some you don't say much to you, just look at them. So it just depends. You got to really figure out. Uh, the first thing someone taught me as a coach is you have to learn your players. You got to learn your players. Luckily, I've, I've been training a lot of them for a, lot, a longer time. So it, it kind of helped. I wasn't. It's not as hard as a transition as I thought it would be. For sure. Don't mind me. I'm just getting my charger. <laughs> coach, being from one of the best basketball cities in North Carolina, 
Do you feel like do you feel like Fayetteville kind of gets the respect that they deserve? We take it if we don't get it. So <laughs> you just gotta look. You just gotta look on TV. We're constantly producing killers or people doing their thing on the next level. There's always the next one up. And I ain't saying everybody else isn't doing it. I just know that. Good gracious, how could you not? How many state championships do you want to see? Girls, boys, whatever. No, a lot, a lot, a lot of talent. A lot of talent comes through Fayetteville, no doubt. Um, <laughs> the resume of Fayetteville kind of speaks for itself. So, but I just think you know I don't want to just point out Fayetteville. I'm just gonna say Hoop State. We just gonna we go. We're not a part. It's North Carolina against everybody, and I think that we collectively are not playing the games considering the amount of capital we have, you know, as far as how big is our, how big our state is. Of course, California may have more or someone else. Now, Indiana's pretty good. I know they get a whole bunch too. So, but aside from that, I think that we're on a, we're on the brink of huge things. A lot of my big, my big goal for us, I want us to have like, we, we need to have a Oak Hill or a Mount Verde or some type of boarding school this big time that all of our top guys can go to and we could punish people like uh, everyone else is doing. You know, and I don't think we, I don't like that our talent has to leave our state. I hate that. I never, ever, ever want our talent to have to leave our state. I feel like you can get everything you want in North Carolina. We have the most colleges per capita other than California. If you want to be, if you can't, if you haven't been seen in North Carolina, you ain't going to be seen anywhere. We got top division ones, division two, division threes, NAIA. And I'm talking about the top ones in every group. That means you go D2, you're looking at Queens and other schools like Wingate and other way you go d3 you're still dealing with wesley and all them other guys you go in d1 we go acc we go we can go mid-major we can go low it, it is so many so much stuff to do like i don't know why you would that's why I, i'm not surprised how smart mikey williams people were i think they were geniuses they had some information early about knowing what was going to happen with california what's the first state we should go to oh let's go to hoop state let's go to hoop state that's what a bump is that's where all the talent is. That's where all the people in my class are that are being ranked high. I need to go where that is. I like that type of energy. So, I mean, I, I like Fayetteville. I like Raleigh. I like Charlotte. I like Greenfield. I mean, there's so many schools in areas that people don't even know the talent. I mean, Kinston just had that whole thing come out. There's no way people knew that many pros and people were coming out of there and still coming out. But thanks to Anthony Bruton and all those other guys. So, we really appreciate people like you, you know, with Phenom and with uh, Lamont were getting recruited and all these other people, you know, Charles Scott, there's a whole lot of people around like that are helping build our, um, build the state so everyone can know. We When I first started, I was be one of the, like maybe three people videoing. Me, Ball is Life, Hoop Mixtape. Now everyone's videoing. There's, everyone gets footage. Everyone's, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's really good, you know, because you can never have enough footage on yourself because that's how you got to sell yourself. That's how, you, that's how you get seen. That's how you get your scholarships. Because especially with COVID going on, it is re it, they have to rely even more on people like you because they trust y'all opinion. And y'all have the events with all the top players. So why wouldn't we ask you what you guys thought about the guys that came to your event? Y'all are geniuses on top of geniuses. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. You're ahead of the game, man. Y'all playing chess while everybody else playing checkers. Way ahead. <laughs> I love it. Uh <laughs> I, obviously, it's your first year at Cape Fear. Uh, what are your goals for this year and for upcoming years? Uh, my goal is to, um, first of all, change the culture of the city. You know, of Irwin and Dunn, it's kind of difficult this year considering um, COVID. So they can't be as, we can't do a lot of things in the community and bring us closer, you know. So it's kind of like we're kind of, we are having success, but we can't involve the, the normal everybody can't come in the gym so that's unfortunate so I have to make my goals a little different and more specific so first off with my two centers my two senior centers I want to make sure I get them scholarships and they graduate I want to make sure everybody on our team finishes with high GPA I want to make sure that everyone on our team 10th grade and up is taking the SAT and the ACT just in case you know what I'm saying to figure out you know whether they make them have to have requirements or not I want to make sure that um uh that we we win our, our, our regular season championship. I want to win the conference championship and I want to win the state championship. And then I want to go into the summer with team wall and I want to win there too. So 
everything's about winning. Everything's about preparing to be great and also being humble enough to know you could lose. You know, I, I, half the battle is learning how to lose and how to deal with adversity. And most of my kids and parents have to adjust to that. You know, everyone's so used to just everything working out. And I keep telling them that if we didn't win it, we didn't earn it. And it's not it's not our time yet. It doesn't mean that it won't happen. It's just delayed. We just got to keep working. So whatever we learn from this particular game or this particular moment is going to propel us for later on. Just like when I didn't know why God had me in rec centers working with all these random kids training. And then he was preparing me to be in the position I'm in now. So I'm just worthy. I'm happy. You know, when you're dealing with courses and purpose, it's so weird. You know, you just got to pray more and hope that, you know, you don't hinder any of the blessings coming your way. But right now, I think that I, I planted enough seeds and I think I, I deserve to get some type of prayer for judgment. So when I get people like you in my life or, or your father or your brother or other people that are trying to help build me and the program to help me to help these kids and be do things the right way, I, I'm so happy, abundantly happy and appreciative. So the goal is to win. <laughs> for sure. You talked about <laughs> adversity a little bit, and obviously you're going to hit adversity in life, not only on the basketball court. And those are the things that just build you for your, um, gets you stronger in the long run. And then the one thing I loved was, you know, God puts you in situations where he's going to meet, he's going to have you meet people that's going to help you down the line. And the people you were training in random rec centers helped you be the coach you are right now. So it's, it's, yes. crazy, it's crazy how God puts you in situations where at the time you just don't understand, but in the long term you look back and he's like, man, I know exactly why he put me in that situation. It only made me stronger. It only made me better. And obviously, I mean, the more faith driven you are, the more and more times that's going to happen. So yes. um, that's, that's awesome. Um, what is your kind of motto, your mission statement to your, for your team and for your daily walk? Um, I had one, but now I feel like I want to change it. But what I used to, what I always tell my kids is uh, the hardest place to be is exactly where you're supposed to be. And it ain't easy. So basically, no matter what your situation is, uh, a lot of times God doesn't make mistakes. He never makes mistakes. So wherever you are right then, that's where you're supposed to be. And you just have to deal with whatever adversity is. Because, you know, we always give the example of change, you know, in any type of growth, it's pain. You know, me growing from 5'11 to 6'5 was pain. You know, me having to adjust, having a girlfriend, if you have a girlfriend for, for eight years and y'all break up, that's pain. You have a game you worked all game about and you lose it, that's pain. But then there's growth because you learn. So the motto is to understand that we're going to get hit, we're going to fall down, all that stuff's going to happen. But you're supposed to be dealing with that right now. For you to be able to enjoy and receive whatever type of uh, reward that is meant for you, you got to pay your dues and you got to realize that it ain't going to be easy and it's not going to be snap, crackle, pop. You got to earn it. So that's always, you know, earn everything, all that. Everything in my gym is consistent together, team, family, you know, togetherness. I watch a lot of, um, what's my favorite coach's name? He was at West Virginia. Where is he at now? Is it, what's my man's name? He's so he's, he's at, he was at Virginia Tech too. He might still be there. Who's at Virginia Tech? Um, oh man, Virginia not Tech important. Coach was at Wofford. Huh? The Virginia Tech coach was at Wofford. No way, he's there now. The yeah. one that was just there? No, Mike Young. Oh, the Wofford. Young. Okay. Who was there before Mike Young? Um, Buzz Williams. He's a take it. Okay, so the coach was either at Marquette or West Virginia, and then he went to he went to the ACC, and I feel like he went to Virginia Tech. He's uh, don't worry about. It. I'm I'm gonna remember what his name is when when it kind of doesn't matter. <laughs> but regards to that, I love a lot of the things he does as far as team building between him and uh, Kobe Carl. And people don't know. I was like, it's kind of awkward. Like, why would you look at Kobe Carl? Well, first off. His father is George Carl, so he's a genius. Like, his dad was a defensive mastermind and did really good stuff in the 90s. And um, then I thought about the fact that his son played uh, college ball at a smaller school. Then, then he went, he played G League, made to the NBA, all that stuff. So I felt, and then he's a coach. So I thought his perspective on the game would be just valuable. So during, like, COVID, 
uh, I think I stumbled across one of his podcasts and I just started studying them. And I was just like, man, as far as new age, his, his idea of how to be your player uh, coach relationships is completely different. It's, it was amazing to listen to the stuff he did. And it kind of like changed my perspective going into my situation as far as coaching. So yeah, like you said, like, you know, models and stuff, it just has to always be along with us and, you know, we're going to get where we got to go. I love it. Um, Obviously, there's no doubt in my mind that you're going to be a really successful coach. There's no doubt. You already have a lot of wins and you're going to continue to win a lot of games. But how do you want to be remembered as a coach? I want to be remembered as a coach to care. A coach to care and a coach that kept his word. And he fulfilled his purpose. You know, a coach that fulfilled his purpose. Your purpose is always to get your kids where they need to be. So that's always the purpose. You want to change the environment you're in and you want to make it where it's easier for all the other kids to come in. So all the stuff that happened to us that we had shortcomings with, the new generation is not supposed to suffer from those things. So that's my that's my that's my course and that's my purpose. I love it. And I know you're gonna to continue to do that. And all your kids are gonna love you as a coach. There's no doubt <laughs> in my mind. Like you said earlier, you're a very likable person. And we appreciate all your support and love for us. And oh, so we're going to continue, uh, obviously, to get down there and show you guys more love. So I appreciate we it. We can't wait. You know we love when y'all come. Man. We Sounds love when y'all come. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming on here. Um, Coach Mims, one of the best up-and-coming coaches, no doubt, in high school basketball. Um, have a great team this year, and they're going to continue to have better teams here in the future. I appreciate it. I appreciate you speaking that in. And thank you for even having us on here. You know, any type of platform that promotes building kids and also promotes helping, you know, with my team and stuff that I, man, to even thought of to be in the pie. I appreciate it, man. That means a lot. I'm humble because I know how great you are, whether y'all might not speak on it enough or say it because y'all are such good people. But we appreciate you guys, man. Y'all keep doing what y'all do. Sounds good. Appreciate you. All right. See you shortly.